I'm not mistaken, and that's entirely possible. Somebody tell me. I believe that at this moment, that Lone Star Con 2 is proud to introduce Chelsea Award-winning sculptor Claiborne Moore and the 1997 Hugo design. I've done my microphone, but that doesn't seem to do anything. <laughs> Hi, it's, a, it's my pleasure. Um, just to defend myself, I heard it the last, that's the first I heard that this was going to be happening. But um, in lieu of any sculptor being able to ever win a Hugo Award, they allow us sculptors to work on the bases each year. So, so I'm a lot of breath. But it was a great honor. Um, I was proud to be selected, and it was such a pleasure to do this. And um, I wonder where they are. <laughs> but oh, <laughs> what we did on this one to celebrate the fact that it was in the great Lone Star State of Texas was we designed uh, using pink granite from the from the Marble Falls area. Um, this sort of granite which is used to build the capital and all the buildings around the capital and our, our uh, state capital. And this Texas pink granite in the shape of the state of Texas. And I hope you like it and it represents our great state. Um, once again, thank you very much. It was a pleasure doing this and a great honor. If there are any of those, if there are any extras of that. <laughs> you know. um, that's all right, never mind. Uh, I'd like to introduce a guy named Teddy Harvia, or Harvia, or something, who would, is going to announce our Hugo winner for the best fan artist. The guy who's going to do this, Teddy, is a Hugo winner himself twice. And he did this because he can draw real good. <laughs> yeah. He does it by hand. And uh, <laughs> he stays, I understand, he stays in the lines and doesn't trace anything <laughs> unless there's a deadline or something like that. When it's, and of course, that's OK. Uh, there's a very peculiar thing in his bio here that says he has collected every postcard printed. And after this is over, I'd like to show you a couple of postcards, Teddy, <laughs> that you never dreamed of collecting before. <laughs> Are you there? If you're there, do it. First off, I'm not Michael Bernstein. They told me to jump up as soon as the Campbells were announced so I'd be ready to come on stage. Uh, so I'm not Michael Bernstein. Uh, I've, I've seen the, the Yugos up close. They're, they're really nice, and I'd like to announce that there's a uh, last minute hint uh, uh, written uh, nominee to be added, and I'd like to add him right now, just because I'd really like to have one of these. They left one of these, can I? You want this? You want this one too? Uh, the, the category that I'm going to be awarding is uh, Best Fan Artist. The nominees are Ian Gunn, Joe Mayu. Peggy Ranson, Bill Rotzler, and 
and Sherlock. And, and here in Texas, we don't open with our hands. We open with a knife. <laughs> the winner is Bill Rotzler. I'm clearly not Bill, but I am here to accept for him tonight. As so most of you may know, he's been ill for the past year. He is getting better, slowly but surely, and he asked me to thank all the little people, both of them, for this award. <laughs> so I do on his behalf. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd next like to present a man who will be presenting the Hugo for the best fan writer, and the man's name is Roy Tackett. Roy, Roy ought to know about fans. If anybody is Mr. Science Fiction fan, this is the guy that is. He's a veteran of the Marines. He's a publisher. He's a world traveler. He has earned our respect. In spite of hanging out with people like Bob Vardaman, Stephen R. Donaldson and Fred Saberhagen and, and uh, that two-bit, half-assed magician, Walter John Williams. <laughs> Which is okay, Roy, because we all, we all make mistakes. If you're here, give a big hand for the Where are you, Roy? Hi, guy. Good to see you. I, ha I have uh, a, a list of best fan writers, and the uh, list starts off with Sharon Farber. <laughs> Mike Glare. <laughs> Andy Hooper. Dave Langford, and uh, Evelyn C. Reaper. And uh, we'll get the envelope open in a minute or two. Dave Langford. Something for Dave is Martin Hoare. Well, uh, I'm, I'm not Dave Langford, I'm Martin Hoare, as you probably know. It's an unaccustomed pleasure to be with you tonight. <laughs> Dave sends a very big thank you for this Hugo Award. Now, this is my opportunity for revenge. In February this year, the British Convention Attitude presented its very own Trilby Awards, including a prize for the best spoof award. By popular vote, this went to the Hugos, so Dave accepted on their behalf. I was at Boscone in America, and the bastard found me and got me out of bed at five in the morning to tell me that Hugo's had won! <laughs> well, you all know what I'm going to do tonight, don't you? I was hoping that this 
was hoping this wouldn't come up that I wouldn't have to introduce Brad Denton because I don't like Brad very much. And <laughs> I like Brad's wife, Barb, she's very nice. I don't care for Brad. Brad has won a uh, World Fantasy Award. Um, he wrote a book called Rack and Roll, Buddy Holly is Alive and Well in Mead, Blackburn about a real fun psycho guy. And he wrote one called Lunatics very recently. And as near as I can tell, this is about a uh, real horny guy who gets it on with a bird. Th that's all I can <laughs> I don't understand the book. I don't understand it yet. Anyway, in spite of all this, hi. In spite of all this, this is a guy that, along with my good friend and another Terrific writer, William Browning Spencer, Brad, and I, the three of us, have Chinese lunch every week. And uh, that's a sight to see, I'll tell you that. I, I go out with these guys anytime I can. This is on days when I have free time, when I'm not doing the, you know the little gray stuff that gets in your comb? <laughs> uh, and the, and the, you know, then the, kind of, sometimes it's oily, sometimes. And you got to get it out of there. But on the days that I've got a clean comb, I don't have anything to do, I go out with Brad <laughs> uh, and Bill Spencer. So, Brad, if you got nothing better to do, just come on, come on out, pal. I'm not even going to try. <laughs> As someone who has been reviewed, interviewed, and other verbs that end in ewed by various fanzines, I have come to realize that the influence and impact of the fan press is considerable. It matters not whether a fanzine circulation is 50 or 500, or whether it is produced on a state-of-the-art workstation or on the slurpy stained photocopier down at the 7-Eleven. What does matter is a fanzine's content, because what is often revealed about one's work, or about oneself, in a powerfully written fanzine can bring as much joy, or inflict as much pain, as anything published in the professor, professional press. In short, a strong fanzine can be an instrument of change, which is, after all, one of the hallmarks of our field. And while it is true that fanzines sometimes instigate aggravation, apprehension, frustration, consternation, and anxiety, it is also true that right now, for this one brief moment, I get to return the favor. <laughs> the nominees for Best Fanzine are Ansible, edited by Dave Langford, File 770, edited by Mike Glyer. Mimosa, edited by Dick and Nikki Lynch. Nova Express, edited by Lawrence Person. And Tangent, edited by Dave Truesdale. And the Hugo goes to Mimosa, Dick, Dick and Nikki Lynch, editors. This is a real surprise. Uh, we'd like to thank the contributors first and foremost, because without them, we wouldn't have Mimosa. And we'd like to thank all the members of WISPA who've stood behind us and keep urging us on. Thank you. There's a couple other people I'd like to thank as well. Roxanne Smith-Graham, the person who has brought uh, the printed version of Mimosa to the World Wide Web. Uh, she has really done an outstanding job, and, and this actually half belongs to her, in my opinion. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, 
all the other nominees in this category. There are some very fine fanzines. I only wish it could have been a five-way tie. And lastly, I'd like to thank Dave Kyle. Back in 1979 at the NASFIC in Louisville, Kentucky, he came up to us and was musing that, gee, I don't think there's enough fan history in fanzines anymore. What do you think about that? Thanks, Dave. You're, you're our mentor, and we really appreciate it. Next time, Brad, remember it's just a presentation, it's not your inaugural address. <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to, and I hope I have this right of the program, uh, we haven't done too badly, uh, Mitch Bentley, Mitch Bentley around anywhere to give the award for the best pro artist is that you, Mitch? Right on time. This is uh, quite an honor for me. Um, fortunately, I, I know all of these guys with uh, one minor exception, exception, which would be the first one on my list. The nominees for this year's Best Professional Artist are Thomas Canty, <laughs> David Cherry, Uncle Bob Eggleton. Don Mates, our guest. And of course, Michael Whalen. I'm sorry, there must be some mistake. This is, uh, this is the award for best hair. This is Uncle Bob Eggleton got it once again. <laughs> Too cool. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he is the personal embodiment of Abba. No. Uh, <laughs> I just want to thank everybody for this. This is so, um, this is so amazing. Wow. <laughs> I'm out of breath, sorry. I'm an old man. <laughs> it's the way to the hair, okay? That's it. That's it. This, um, again, Thanks so much. This is a tremendous, this is a great category, and it's a great group of people to be nominated with. And every single one of them is a good friend, and I'm just very proud to be here. Thank you so much. Next, I'm going to introduce you to two ladies who are going to present the best semi prosine. You go. It's Pat Cadigan and Ellen Datlow. Pat Cadigan is the writer of Sinners, Fools, other wonderful books. Ellen is editor of Omni Online, a great editor. She's done best of the year anthologies for horror and fantasy and fairy tales, etc. cetera. Uh, it's kind of embarrassing to me because both of these ladies have been pursuing me for some years. <laughs> and uh, I've tried to be kind and uh, say that I don't want to get down to that level. I just, just keep it like... Um, I can't, I don't know why we're doing this, no one told me, but they're both going to come out and present at the same time. I'm only assuming that one walks while the other chews gum. I don't know. <laughs> don't boo me, I didn't choose this. The ladies are there. Oh, 
got it. Got to see me. Hi, sweetie. Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What I want to know is, Bob Eggleton, do you use a conditioner or a detangler? <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know. It's a Hugo I want to go for. Now, I know what you're thinking. Can Thelma and Louise present a Hugo? We're two. We can do two Hugos. Watch this. For best semi-prosine, and I don't know why I'm presenting this award, I don't know a thing about semi-pros. <laughs> and I deserve royalties, too. <laughs> what, actually, what happened was Gardner and, ran into George R. R. Martin, and Gardner was wearing a Are You a Bimbo button, and George was wearing Writers Deserve Royalties, and the buttons fell down and all the words got mixed up and when they picked it up it said bimbos deserve royalties. <laughs> Mom! <laughs> you promised you and your friends would stay home. Uh, okay, we're... Oh, best semi-prosine. Okay. Best semi-prosine candidates. Uh, and I want you to watch carefully for the first runner-up because if for some reason... The winner is unable to fulfill the Hugo duties. The first runner-up will be called upon to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Best semi-prosine, the nominees are Interzone, edited by David Pringle. Okay. Locus edited by Charles N. Brown. Oh, this is kind of a gang edit. The New York Review of Science Fiction, edited by Katherine Kramer, Ted Dembinsky, Ariel Hamayon. Did I pronounce that sexily enough? That's a really sexy name. I don't care. <laughs> Take what I can get. <laughs> David T. Hartwell, no, some newcomer, and Kevin Maroney. <laughs> Science Fiction Chronicle, edited by Andrew I. Porter. <laughs> oh, what's on TV tonight? Oh, and Speculations, edited by Kent Brewster. I have to rip it open with my teeth. <laughs> okay, I hope they're watching. You know, in, you know, in science fiction, it used to be Big Brother is watching. Now it's Big Brother, watch this. Oh, you lucky man. Charles N. Brown, come and get it. I, I wore my lucky shirt tonight just to make sure I'd win. Uh, but. I got scared because I forgot earlier in the year and I actually washed it. Uh, as usual, I'd like to thank the staff. Since I have to do less and less work every year, what I do is I travel around the world and I send in reports and they put out the magazine. Uh, as the magazine is a product of many, many people and uh, they all deserve thanks, including all the people who voted for it. Thank you. And I'm presenting the best professional editor, Hugo. 
Um, I said I would do it only in the condition that I was allowed to allude to the fact that Patrick Nielsen Hayden took my slot on the ballot. So, and I said I'd be subtle about it and Wait, kind. Pa Patrick Nielsen Hayden took your slot on the ballot? Mm-hmm. Thelma, what? I think he should apologize. <laughs> Where is he? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Shot on sight. All right, the nominees are Gardner de Zoua, Scott Edelman, Patrick Nielsen Hayden, Christine Catherine Rush, and Stanley Schmidt. With the teeth, with the teeth. I'm afraid, I'll, cut, I'll get a paper cut. <laughs> <laughs> you're, so, you're so delicate. They raided her closet, decorate. Yes. The winner is Garda de Zoua. Before you accept, no, wait, wait, wait. Before you accept your Hugo, do you want to see, the, we have a special Hugo for you. That's not really the one you're getting. I'm taking that one home. I have something else. Wait a minute. Well, thank you. I'm touched. I knew you'd love it. I'll treasure it all. That's right. Back. Wow, it really is shaped like Texas. Uh, Pennsylvania will be jealous when I, I go home. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you. Uh, it's been a rough few years for the magazine business in general, but by God, we're still here, and uh, we all work very hard on Asimov, all of us who work on it, and we're pleased that you enjoy it, and uh, we intend to keep bringing you the best science fiction we can find for uh, many years to come. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Did you want some opera, Hugo, Ellen? No, oh, I guess she does. God, they're lovely. <laughs> Don Mage is going to be making a presentation here for the best dramatic presentation. Don has two Hugos, one special Hugo, has eight Chelsea's, and his bio says that he has no established work habits, and if he doesn't, uh, he's, he's got to be doing something sometime because he's, he's really terrific. He apparently does bad puns, and if this is the worst anyone can say about him, I think uh, you need to worry about that because if you look at his work, uh, it's why a lot of lesser talents go hide themselves in a closet somewhere because he's a great, great artist. Don, are you around somewhere? <laughs> You're right there. I was hoping to have an opportunity to get a bunch of you together, and since this is a great one, uh, I would like to say thank you all for having me here. It's been a real pleasure and a, very much an honor. Um, I've been elected or drafted into... <laughs> I've been elected to um, present the best dramatic presentation, Hugo, and I thought it would have been um, very important for me to have something dramatic to say, but. I couldn't really think of anything, and I thought, well, maybe it would be okay if I had something cheeky to say, and I really couldn't think of anything again, and so I decided to have a few beers instead. So um, I think I'm going to make a brouhaha out of the best dramatic presentation. Okay, the first nominee 
I uh, hope we're ready for this, it, uh, for the best dramatic presentation, Hugo, is Independence Day from Central, Centropolis Film Productions, 20th Century Fox Film, directed by Roland Emmerich, written by Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich, produced by Dean Devlin. about to happen to him? Oh, not a chance in hell. Good night. out here in 30 seconds. I ain't heard no fat lady. Forget the fat lady. You're obsessed with the fat lady. Drive us out of here. Oh, they're chasing us. This is a little bit ridiculous. They gave me a TV set up here and they said everything that's on that screen will be in this one. And right now I'm pulling in something like the Ed Sullivan show. <laughs> anyway, um, the next nominee for the best dramatic presentation, Hugo, is Mars Attacks. It's a Warner Brothers film directed by Tim Burton, written by Jonathan Gems, produced by Tim Burton and Larry Franco. Open it. Oh, sulfur ramp is it's coming out like a giant tongue. Oh. This is great. Topo Gigio was saying hi to Eddie. <laughs> oh, um, the next the best dramatic presentation nominee is Babylon 5, the episode Severed Dreams. This is from Warner Brothers, directed by David J. Eagle, written by J. Michael Straczynski, produced by John Copeland. Three enemy furies locking on. Hang on. solution on the rolling oak and stand by to redirect all defensive fire. Hang tight. Coming around. 
time for another run. Commander, the Churchill. Hiroshi, get out of there. Get to the life pods. Too late to get out. Our primary systems are hit. We've got fire on all decks now. There's nothing we can do except... Hiroshi? Hiroshi! The next nominee, Star Trek First Contact, Paramount Pictures, directed by Jonathan Frakes, story by Ronald D. Moore, Brandon Braga, and Rick Berman, screenplay by Ronald D. Moore and Brandon Braga, produced by Rick Berman. I believe I speak for everyone here, sir, when I say, to hell with our orders. Red alert. All hands to battle stations. Engage. Report. Main power's offline. We've lost the shields and our weapons are gone. <laughs> Perhaps today is a good day to die. Prepare for running speed! Sir, there's another starship coming in. It's the Enterprise. This is great. We got rid of Ed Sullivan, and now they're airing the Twilight Zone. One of those. Um, um, okay. The last entry for best dramatic presentation is Star Trek: Deep Space Nine: Trials and Tribulations. Boy, they thought of me for this. From Paramount, directed by Jonathan West, written by Ronald D. Moore, Renee. Uh oh. Ed. Thank you. It's your very yeah. I'm sorry. Story by Ira Stephen Bear and Hans. Uh oh. Thank you. Robert Hewitt. Wolf. <laughs> You're catching me being really in a brouhaha. Uh, executive producers Ira Stephen Bear and Rick Berman, adapted from a screenplay by David Gerald. Past three hours. Having drinks while we've been crawling through conduits. Oh my God, that's him. Who? Oh, Kirk. Where? On the left. And the gold, just sitting down. That's Kirk? It would be an honor to meet him. Let's buy him a drink. Gentlemen, no one is buying anyone a drink. He's right. We can't risk altering the timeline. What will it be, boys? And don't ask for Ractagino. If I have to say we don't carry Who that one more time. the Ractagino? The Klingons. Klingons? Over there and over there. Those are Klingons? All right. The boys have had enough. Mr. War? They are Klingons. And it is a long story. What? Some kind of genetic engineering? A viral mutation? Would you not discuss it with outsiders? <laughs> Easy, lad. Everybody's entitled to an opinion. That's right. And if I think that Kirk is a Denebian slime devil. Well, that's my opinion, too. Don't do it, mister, and that's an order.
Well, I'm going to open up this thing with not a knife, but a Texas toothpick. And the winner is Severed Dreams, Babylon 5. The snipers had that one covered. <laughs> uh, first off, this is dedicated to the fans more than anything else who've kept this show going when I thought it was going to fall apart. Second thing, I have a problem with television. It offers too many easy answers and not damn near enough good questions. When we began to sell Babylon 5, I said I want this to be about questions because the answers you get are only as good as the questions that are asked. The questions in television tend to be ephemeral and trivial. Will they get the bad guy? Will the bomb go off before our guys can save the truck? We know what those answers are. I wanted to do a show. I said, who are you? What do you want? Where are you going? And why are you here? Because those answers aren't easily defined. And they said at the networks, who wants to watch a show like that? Thank you for answering that question far more eloquently than I ever could. Thank you. I know you'll be, hello. I know you'll be pleased to hear that the Winning episode will be shown right here after the awards. <laughs> you don't believe this? Stay. <laughs> uh, the next person I'm going to introduce for best nonfiction, I'll just name a few titles here. Lord Valentine's Castle, Majapur Chronicles, Dying Inside. If you don't know who it is, then you're in the wrong area here. You need to go up to the other ballroom where they're doing something else. Robert Silverberg. Thank you. And I want very quickly to put your minds at ease. Those of you who may remember seeing me on the Yugo platform the last couple of years, nobody in our little tribe, so far as I know, has died in the last day or two. I say so far as I know. But I did request that in the event somebody does, they let Moorcock do the eulogy this year. So I'm just going to give out Best nonfiction book. And the nominees are The Faces of Fantasy by Patty Parrott. <laughs> Look at the Evidence by John Clute. The Silence of the Langford, oh, he's everywhere, by Dave Langford. <laughs> Time and Chance, Earl Sprague de Camp. <laughs> and The Tough Guide to Fantasyland, Diana Wynne Jones. <laughs> Thank you. 
and, and Time and Chance by Elsprague de Camp. Literary agent Eleanor Wood, not at all frail. Sprague and Catherine DeCamp can't be here tonight. They would love to be. This award it means enormous amount to them. The autobiography has been many years in the making. Ninety. It's been ninety years in the making, but it's a long time getting at it, going through the whole publishing process. And this couldn't be a, this is just a wonderful culmination of this work and life. Thank you. I don't think that we could have gotten two more distinguished guests for our last four Hugo Awards. Did anybody try? Did anybody call anybody else and see this? <laughs> Michael Moorcock has saved us from cosmic imbalance, chaos, gas. You know, uh, he's prolific and he's good too. He's written damn near everything. Mike has written 52,000 novels. And that's just, that's just Elric. <laughs> the, guy, the guy's not only super intelligent, he's a veritable genius. Instead of living in England or, uh, or Mallorca or the continent, Mike and Linda, who could live anywhere they want to, chose to settle in the humid, oppressive, hot, tick-ridden, snake-infested forest on the muddy, polluted Colorado in a dump called Bastrop, Texas. Is this guy, is this guy a genius or what? Anyway, if you treasure, as I do, the proud tradition of English literature, if your heart leaps when you read the fast-paced action and snappy dialogue of George Eliot and Bill Thackeray, this guy's gonna knock you for a loop. Let's have a big hand for my friend, Mike Borkow. They promised me if I came to Texas, nobody would ever find me. I said, where am I going to hide? They said, Texas, that's where all the, all the washed up riders go. They said, so. <laughs> I said, but I haven't washed up yet. They said, it's all right, you're English, so I'll let you in anyway. <laughs> um, I'm going to announce the best short story. Um, <clears throat> the nominees this year are The Dead, by Michael Swanwick. Uh, Decency by Robert Reed. Gone by John Crowley. The Soul Selects Her Own Society by Connie Willis. And The Unbirthday Boy by James White. And the winner is The Soul Selects Her Own Society by Connie Willis. Oh, 
gosh, this is so exciting. Um, I know that some of you think that I have too many of these. Um, <laughs> but see, um, I need as many as I can get because um, I'm saving up to trade them in on Harrison Ford. <laughs> And I don't think this will quite do it. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, I have to thank, oh, Kevin Anderson, who asked me to be in the anthology Global Dispatches, a terrific anthology. And I thank him, even though he first originally suggested that I be Laura Ingalls Wilder in my story. Uh, and I have to also thank Sheila Williams and Gardner Desois, who published it in Asimov's magazine. And finally, I have to thank all of you because I don't know why, but you guys are so terrific to me. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, now we have the best novelette. Uh, for this year, the, the nominees are Age of Aquarius by William Barton. Uh, Beauty and the Opera, or The Phantom Beast by Susie McKee Charnas. Bicycle Repair Man by Bruce Sterling. Uh, the Land of Nod by Mike Resnick. And Mountain Ways by Ursula K. Le Guin. It seemed to me that all of these probably should win, but uh, let's see. And the winner is Bicycle Repairman by Bruce Stone. How sweet of you to give me my own Texas-shaped Hugo. <laughs> I'll treasure it the rest of my life, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to thank my friends in uh, the Sycamore Hill Writers' Workshop who would not let me in the door of their conclave without a piece of short fiction. And thank you also to uh, my friends in that workshop for mercilessly beating the story into shape. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> the best novella and best novel. I'm happy to present a man who's done damn near everything. I can't ever pronounce his name. I just like to call him Al. Al has done uh, a little bit of everything. Some of the things I know, like some of the things I've done, I'd like to forget. Uh, Al worked for a food firm called Pickle Packers International. Uh, he has been an account executive way, way back there for a truck ad agency. He's a man of many talents. He's a writer, wrote a good book called Rogue Moon. He's written for Galaxy and Fantasy and Science Fiction. He's now editor of Tomorrow, and he knows Harlan Ellison. <laughs> He's done damn near everything in the field, and I think it's a shame that to have an anticlimax to his career that he would have to come down here with us tonight, but we're glad to have him anyway. Come on out, Al. Please welcome Mr. Algis Budras. I didn't know I was going to have to say anything. And I was not prepared to be funny. So without further ado, nominees for Best in the Mellow are Abandon in Place by Jerry Oldtian. Blood of the Dragon by George R. R. Martin. The 
The Cost to be Wise by Maureen F. McHugh. <laughs> Gas Fish by Mary Rosenblum. <laughs> Immersion by Gregory Benford. Time Travelers Never Die by Jack McDevitt. And the winner. Blood of the Dragon by George R. R. Martin. very pleased to have this. Um, many years ago, when I was a, a high school kid, in the early uh, part of the 60s, uh, a comic fancy, comic fan, I sold my very first uh, stories to a Texas fanzine called Star Studded Comics, little prose superhero stories, edited by three Texas fans. Larry Herndon, Buddy Saunders, and Howard Keltner. Uh, that was really my beginning. And, and through them, I met another Texas fan, a guy named Howard Waldrop, who I, I really wish could be here tonight. Uh, but I'm, I'm very pleased, considering this ancient tie of mine to Texas, to, uh, to win this at a Texas convention. It means a lot to me. Uh, <clears throat> I want to thank everyone who voted for me, and uh, of course, also the people who uh, who helped me make this uh, this novella and a novel of which it's a which it's a part, Game of Thrones, uh, to my agents uh, Kirby and Kay McCauley and Ralph Vicanza, um, the editors who uh, worked on the book, Malcolm, Jane, and Joy at, at Harper Collins in UK, Jennifer Hershey and Han Grohl at uh, at Bantam, and uh, to of course to Sheila Williams and Gardner Dozois at. Asimovs, who uh, are the ones who insisted that somewhere in this gigantic novel there might be uh, a novella that uh, I could carve out, and uh, Gardner gave me the cleaver and helped me set carving. He did, of course, uh, take out all of the hot sex scenes, <laughs> so those of you who want them will have to go out and buy the full book. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much. Oh, and, uh, and special thanks and love to Paris, who thinks she's a, who can no longer claim that she's a Yugo jinx for me. <laughs> All right. The nominees for best novel are Blue Mars by Kim Stanley Robinson. Holy Fire by Bruce Sterling. Memory by Lois McMaster Bruegel. Remnant Population by Elizabeth Moon. And Starplex by Robert J. Sawyer. You know, as a... Well, never mind. <laughs> The winner is Blue Mars. So much faster than George. Yeah, well, speed. 
Thanks very much. Um, a long time ago, Lucius Shepard taught me a thing about thank yous. He said, Stan, you write a story about the Spanish Armada, you win an award, you don't have to thank Philip II of Spain. <laughs> and later I learned another lesson, which is really you ought not to thank the people that helped you that aren't actually at the scene at the time. Create strange scenes afterwards when you talk to them about it. You say, I, uh, I thanked you at the, at the award ceremony for your help. And the person says, oh, well, thank you. And then you say, no, 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 thank you. And they say, well, no, thank you for thanking me. And you say, no, 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 the thanks go to you. And all the time we have to remember that one of the Japanese words for thank you translates literally as, uh, oh, this poisonous feeling. Um, <laughs> However, there is another Japanese word for uh, thank you that translates more like something um, like a blessings on all of involved. And it said, this is why not many Westerners speak Japanese. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, it's that latter type of thank you that I would like to extend to um, Lou Aronica, who first bought the Mars Trilogy, uh, Jennifer Hershey, who edited them, um, Pat Labruto, who has been it's getting them out there. My agent and friend, Ralph Richinanza. Uh, my friend, Beth Meacham. And Gardner Dozwa for his help throughout. Thanks very much also to all who voted for me for the award. Thank you. Well, we're about through with the 55th, and we're going to get on pretty shortly, starting on the 56th. I'd like to say one word or two here, personally, uh, on a semi-serious note, if I can possibly do it, um, that I'm very, very pleased to have been your Toastmaster. I'm a kid, when I grew up, I grew up as a little tiny kid. I had, uh, I had ticks. I had uh, a stutter, the shakes. I was given a mad puppy for my fifth Christmas. My dad found the only orange and brown bicycle in the world, <laughs> gave it to me, and all the bullies in town beat the crap out of me. I was left-handed and skinny and non-athletic, and I had to have the lights on at night, and I wet the bed, and I made below average grades, and my mother took me to the doctor and said, what's wrong? And he came back and said, Ms. Barrett, I'm afraid the little son of a bitch is going to be a writer. <laughs> I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, it could have been worse, you know? There's a lot of things that I would have rather not have done than what I did. I'm very happy to, but we're about over, but there's one thing I'd like to do right now. Lori Wolf, are you around anywhere? Come out here. Come here. Say something intelligent. This is somebody that we owe a lot to for this convention, and we are grateful to you, kid. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> is that it? You going to say anything else? Uh, Just thanks. It's almost over. <laughs> Isn't she wonderful, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> Stay right here. With me. This concludes, this concludes our 1997 Hugo Award ceremony and with, will all the Hugo Award recipients join us on stage after for a photo session and all the audience members wishing to take photos can come front up, up front if they want to do so. Everyone else, uh, leave. <laughs> uh, go have a party and save some single malt for me. A couple of quarts will be fine. Thank you very, very much for being with us. We appreciate you. And a big Texas thank you also to your Toastmaster, Neil Barrett, Jr.